Okay, welcome. Thank you very much for your patience and attention. I'm impressed that hardly anyone left. You're all here, so um, thank you. Uh, welcome to the second lecture of uh, the semester sponsored by Gender Studies Program. Uh, I'm going to, because of the time, I will really shorten my introduction, if that's okay with you, Judy. Um, but, you know, having Dr. Judy Gundry at Westmont for this Gender Studies Lecture Series has been two years in making, and I am really grateful that now, finally, it has become a reality, so grateful for that. Uh, Dr. Gundry graduated uh, from Westmont. I won't tell you the year, <laughs> uh, but she's a Westmont alumna, uh, double majoring in religious studies and comparative literature. She then earned a Master of Arts degree from Fuller Theological Seminary, and also a Doctor of Theology from the University of Tübingen in, Ge in Germany with Magna Cum Laude. Professor Gundry taught uh, in the former Yugoslavia and also at Fuller Theological Seminary in California. She's been teaching at Yale Divinity School since 1998 now as a research scholar and associate professor of New Testament since, 19, uh, since 1998. Her book, Paul and Perseverance, quote, uh, colon, Staying In and Falling Away, deals with the relationship between divine faithfulness and human faith or faithfulness in the letters of Paul. She is also the author of numerous articles on women, gender, and children in early Christianity, as well as the Apostle Paul's understanding of Jesus' death, universalism, divine foreknowledge and beneficence, and the role of conscience. Dr. Gundry is a co-author of, uh, of a book called A Spacious Heart, Essays on Identity and Belonging. And her current book projects include Sex, Marriage, and Celibacy in Eschatological Perspective, a re-examination of 1 Corinthians 7, and also another book project, Grace, Love, Grace, Labor, and Love in the New Creation, Gender Roles in the Pauline Epistles Reconsidered. So you can see that her lecture today is very fresh from her current projects. Dr. Gundry is a recipient of many research grants, including the Pew Evangelical Scholars Program, the Louisville Institute, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. She was elected to a very prestigious Studiorum Novi Testamenta Societies in uh, Societas uh, 1997. And she served in various editorial boards um, and also committees for journals and professional organizations, including the Society of Biblical Literature. On a more personal note, Dr. Gundry was my own teacher at Fuller Theological Seminary. I remember having been intimidated by her at first, um, but quickly that turned into a great respect and admiration for Dr. Gundry as she modeled for me a very thoughtful teaching and a judicious study of the New Testament, especially as a women scholar. A little closer to home, uh, here is a family secret. Well, it's not really a secret. Um, that is, Dr. Judy Gundry is the daughter of Dr. Robert Gundry, our distinguished scholar in residence who taught at Westmont for nearly 40 years before his retirement. If you attended Dr. Bob Gundry's lecture in October, uh, you witnessed his very meticulous and careful scholarship. It turns out that a meticulous and careful scholarship is a family trait uh, exhibited in Dr. Judy uh, Gundry's own accomplished scholarship. So now I am, I am sure that you are eager and more than ready, uh, more than ready to hear Dr. Judy Gundry's lecture herself. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Gundry. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ree, for those kind words of introduction. 
and thank you all for staying around. Um, out of the three planes I had to take to get here, all three were late. <laughs> so I am even uh, more glad than you are that I am here, <laughs> finally. So uh, I'd like to lecture today on uh, one facet of my larger research project on women and gender in the New Testament, especially in Paul's epistles. And um, so this uh, particular lecture will be on Junia. And then I will uh, relate it to some larger questions on gender issues in the New Testament. For decades, New Testament scholars have been exploring the roles of women in the Jesus movement and early Christianity, and their findings are now well known. Many women, as, mel as well as men, followed Jesus as his disciples, and after Jesus died and rose again, Women, as well as men, joined in uh, prayer and waiting in Jerusalem for the gift of the Spirit to be empowered for mission in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Women, as well as men, were involved in the expansion of early Christianity, and they exercised leadership in a variety of ways. Priscilla, with her husband Aquila, were early Christian teachers, and Paul's fellow workers in Corinth, Ephesus, and Rome. They risked their necks, Paul says, to help him. Lydia had a leading role in the church in Philippi as a founding member, possibly together with the women Euodia and Syntyche, who, Paul says, fought for the gospel in Philippi. So uh, Priscilla and Aquila hosted a church in their house in Rome. So did Nympha in, Coloss in Laodicea. And these women may have taken leading roles in these churches that they hosted. Phoebe was a minister, diakonos, of the church in Cancria. And she carried Paul's letter to the Romans to Rome. And she was also a benefactor to Paul and to many, he says. Mary, Tryphena, and Tryphosa worked hard in the Lord. So many women who were involved in so many different ways in the expansion of early Christianity. But did women hold the role positions of highest authority in the early church? Or were they excluded from such positions because they were women, as some have argued? Does the fact that all of the 12 disciples were male support this view? Does the created order and women's roles in it somehow exclude women from the highest roles? The key piece of evidence in the New Testament pertinent to this question is Romans 16, 7. Here Paul writes, Greet Junia and Andronicus, Sorry, I switched them around. Greet Andronicus and Junia, prominent among the apostles. Apostles had the highest authority in the early church. Here, Paul refers to a woman, Junia, as an apostle and a prominent one. The significance of this text did not escape the earliest readers of Romans. Chrysostom writes, quote, And indeed to be apostles at all is a great thing, but to be even amongst those of note, just consider what a great encomium this is. Oh, how great is the devotion of this woman. Not surprisingly, subsequent interpreters have challenged virtually every aspect of Chrysostom's comments. Paul is not referring to a woman, Junia, but a man, Junius. Paul does not say that she is prominent among the apostles, but well known to them. Paul does not say that Junia is an apostle in the strict sense, but a church apostle or a church missionary. Paul does not imply that Junia is the equal of the twelve, or Paul, but is a lesser kind of apostle, essentially a traveling missionary commissioned by Christ. 
I will address all of these controversial points in this lecture. And then I will ask, what conclusions can be drawn for the relation of women's leadership roles in early Christianity to their identities and roles based on the biblical creation narratives reflecting the created order? So first, Junia. Is Paul referring to a woman, Junia, or a man, Junius? The male and female names are indistinguishable in Romans 16, 7, since the only difference between them in the accusative singular form is the accent. This is for the Greek students. And the early Greek manuscripts lack the accents, so the reader had to know whether Paul intended a female name, Junia, uh, in Greek, Unian, or a male name, Junius, in Greek, Unian, different accents. For the first 12 centuries, all interpreters understood the female name, Junia, in Romans 16, 7. And this was because Junia was a common female name. But Junius, was an unknown male name. No evidence for this name has been found in antiquity. It's only a hypothetical contraction of the common male name Junianus, or a similar male name. It's a hypothetical name. In the 13th century, ancient commentators, beginning with Giles of Rome, began to assume that Paul intended the male name Junius. Now, this assumption was certainly not based on any accurate knowledge of onomastics, a study of names, since there is no such male name. Rather, their assumption that it, Paul must be referring to Junius was based on the supposition that since Paul was referring to an apostle, he must be referring to a man. It was not until this assumption was questioned fairly recently by scholars such as Bernadette Bruton and um, J. Eldon Epp that the lack of evidence for the male name Junius was exposed and the majority of interpreters and Bible translators returned to assuming the female name Junia. And the proper accentuation of the female name is now found in the most recent 28th edition of the Greek New Testament edited by Nestle Alant. Second question, was Junia prominent among the apostles or well known to the apostles? That is, was Junia an apostle at all? The view that says she was well known to the apostles is also a late development. The ancient commentators up to the 12th century agreed that Junia was prominent among the apostles. It's a matter of how you translate this Greek expression. Only later did interpreters who questioned the anomaly of a female apostle come up with a different translation well known to the apostles. But the arguments for this view which have been recently presented by Burr and Wallace in an article in New Testament Studies, are not persuasive. They did a thorough search of databases and publications of Greek manuscripts with the Greek construction, episemoien, and equivalent constructions, and they came up with only one genuine parallel for the sense prom uh, well known to as their critics, including uh, Epp and also Linda Belleville and Richard Bauckham, have shown. By contrast, as their critics have also shown, there are several genuine parallels for this construction in the sense prominent among. The majority of interpreters have thus stuck with the ancient interpretation that Junia was prominent among the apostles not well known to the apostles, and thus Junia was an apostle herself, and a prominent one. Third, was Junia an apostle, or just a church missionary? 
The question arises because of the inconsistency in Paul's use of the term apostle, in Greek, apostolos. The term, as you probably know, simply means a someone sent with the authority to speak on behalf of someone else or to do a task on behalf of someone else, a messenger. Paul sometimes uses the, the term apostle to refer to messengers sent by a church or a human being. But the vast majority of occurrences of this term in Paul's letters are for apostles sent by Christ. And there's obviously a big difference in terms of authority between the apostle sent from a church and the apostle sent by Christ. We see this, for example, in Galatians 1.1, where Paul introduces his letter himself to the Galatians, Paul, an apostle, not from human beings, nor by a human being, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. Clearly, there's a lot at stake here. For several reasons, I think, it is virtually certain that Paul is referring to Junia as an apostle sent by Christ, although she may also have been a church missionary, we just don't know. First, in Romans 16, 7, Paul says that Junia is prominent among the apostles. The apostles, with the article in Greek, in Paul, the apostles always refers to Christ's apostles. There's no instance of the apostles or the apostle that doesn't refer to Christ's apostle. It never refers to a church missionary or messenger. For example, in 1 Corinthians 15, 5 to 8, Paul says that the resurrected Jesus appeared to Cephas, the 12, more than 500 brothers and sisters at once, James, and then, quote, he appeared to all the apostles. So the apostles in Paul are those who saw the resurrected Jesus and at that time were appointed as his apostles. Second, when Paul is referring to missionary apostles or church messengers, he always mentions the church or human being that sent them but he doesn't do this in Romans 16, 7. And third, what sense would it make for Paul to say that Junia and Andronicus are prominent among the church missionaries? They weren't a set group, so how could, they be prom how could Junia and Andronicus be prominent among them? Thus, scholars such as Craig Blomberg are incorrect to say that Junia is an apostle in the sense of someone sent on a mission. This interpretation conflicts with Paul's use of the term the uh, apostle, specifically the apostles. Now the fact that we don't have any direct information on when or how Junia became an apostle is of Christ is no counter argument for this information is lacking for most of Christ's apostles think of the more than 500 how many of them do we know by name it's plausible that Junia became an apostle of Christ along with those who numbered more than 500 that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 15 this would agree with his description of Junia and Andronicus as my fellow uh, country folk or my kin or fellow Jews because that group was uh, Jewish. And uh, it would agree with Paul's description of them as those who were before me in Christ uh, because these were the original, the first generation Jewish Christ followers. Junia's Latin name, Junia's Latin, and Andronicus's Greek name suggest that they may have been pilgrims to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover at the time when Jesus was crucified. And therefore, they would have been present for one of the post-resurrection appearances. So all we know about Junia, even though it's little, fits with the interpretation that she was Christ's apostle. 
As Christ's apostle, what would Junia have done? She would have gone out and proclaimed her testimony, her eyewitness testimony about Christ. Having seen him after the resurrection, she would have founded churches. Some have suggested that she and Andronicus co-founded the church in Rome. That's a speculation. We don't know. But she is in Rome at the time Paul writes Romans and greets her and Andronicus. What else would she have done? Christ's apostles performed signs and wonders and mighty works, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 12. These were the signs of the apostle of Christ. So she would have done that too. And these kind of activities would have met with opposition, which explains why Junia was, according to Paul, at one time his fellow prisoner. She was imprisoned for fulfilling fulfilling her apostolic commission, just like Paul was. And as Christ's apostle, Junia had an apostolic associate, Andronicus. He may have been her husband, her brother, we just don't know. Apostles of Christ typically traveled and worked in pairs. For example, Paul traveled with Barnabas, another apostle, and Silas, and Titus also apostles. Other gospel workers also traveled in, and worked in pairs. For example, Priscilla and Aquila, a married Christian couple who were teachers. And Tryphena and Tryphosa, sisters, who, whom Paul says were workers in the Lord. So there was this practice of working in pairs and traveling in pairs. The purpose of traveling with an associate was so that the apostolic preaching could be confirmed by a second opinion, a second authorized opinion. The uh, German scholar uh, Joachim Jeremias has traced the early Christian practice of sending in pairs, sending apostles or messengers in pairs, to the Jewish practice of sending in pairs. Base, which was based on the requirement that by the, wor wor by the mouth of two or three shall every word be established. So Thomas Schreiner is almost certainly incorrect to state that, quote, if Junior was an apostle, she probably functioned particularly as a missionary to women, end quote. Rather, based on the early Christian adoption of the Jewish practice of sending in pairs to confirm the testimony. Junia Andronic and Andronicus were co-apostles. They spoke to the same audience, and one of them functioned as the main speaker, and the other one provided the authorized confirmation of the message. Otherwise, if Junia and Andronicus were speaking to different audiences, a male audience and a female audience, <clears throat> then they would have each had to have an associate to give the confirmation of the message. But they were each other's associates. So <clears throat> Schreiner's suggestion about Junia's function is simply ignorant of this background. Third, uh, our fourth question actually, um, controversial question was, was Junia an apostle of Christ with the highest level of authority and leadership. According to Douglas Moo, who's written a major commentary on Romans, recently published, we cannot infer that Junia had, quote, an authoritative leadership position such as that held, held by the Twelve and by Paul, end quote. Why? According to Moo, Paul is here using the term apostle in this loose sense of traveling missionary. Mu doesn't deny that the traveling missionaries were commissioned by Christ, but he distinguishes between traveling missionaries, different levels of authority. But against Mu, Peter and Paul were traveling missionaries, and we would have to exclude them from the most authoritative positions of leadership if Mu is correct. Traveling missionaries can't be the top leaders. That's inconsistent. Mu is correct, however, 
to imply that there were different levels of authority or leadership among Christ's apostles. And this point is not generally recognized among New Testament scholars, probably because Paul's apology for his apostleship, which he uh, makes especially in the Corinthian correspondence, his apology is construed as implying his equality with other apostles. But that's actually not what Paul is claiming, as we see from some of the key texts in Paul on apostles. First of all, such distinctions in levels of authority or reputation are reflected, of apostles, are reflected in the list of the post-resurrection appearances, which I already referred to in 1 Corinthians 15, 5 to 8. And this is based on tradition, pre-Pauline tradition. In this text, Cephas and the Twelve are mentioned first. James is also explicitly mentioned. And then all the apostles are mentioned next to last. And then last, Paul is mentioned as an apostle. So we have a pecking order, right, in this traditional formula in 1 Corinthians 15. Pecking order of apostles. Similarly, in Galatians 1 and 2, Paul refers to Peter, James, and John as, quote, the influential ones, and those reputed to be something, and thirdly, those deemed to be pillars. He also calls them the apostles before me, and before me can be taken either chronologically, they became apostles before me, or in terms of rank, they had a higher rank than I did, or a higher, better reputation than I did. Or it could be both. But in any case, in Galatians 1 and 2, Paul implies the supreme positions of leadership of these three. And that's also implied in Paul's going to Jerusalem 14 years after his conversion or call to meet with these three privately, he says, and, quote, put before them the gospel I teach, lest I might run or have run in vain. This statement probably suggests not that Paul was afraid he was preaching the wrong thing and they would correct him. He knew he was preaching the right thing because he said, my gospel is not from man, it's, it's from God. So what he means about running in vain is probably that these three apostles were so influential, they had the power to destroy his mission. Their influence was so great that he had to deal with the discrepancy between their reputations and his. And the agreement that they reached at the end of this meeting was to separate mission fields. James, Cephas, and John would go to the circumcised. Paul and Barnabas would go to the Gentiles. And this, by this agreement, Paul effectively neutralized their power and influence over his ministry by separating the mission fields. The later incident at the church in Antioch, which Paul reports in Galatians 2, 11 to 14, demonstrates how the superior authority of the apostles James <clears throat> and Peter could in fact in fact, affect dramatic changes in the actions of other Jewish Christian apostles, lesser ones, such as Barnabas, as well as regular church members. Here Paul reports that when some came from James to Antioch, Cephas dropped his customary practice of eating together with the Gentiles, quote, out of fear of the circumcision. And the apostle Barnabas and the rest of the Jews in Antioch joined Cephas, seeing his example, in withdrawing from table fellowship with Gentiles. So Peter, James, and John exercised the most authority among early Christian apostles, at least in Jerusalem, and to some extent even outside the city, Antioch and Syria, and possibly way outside Jerusalem, because Paul's worried that he will have run in vain. In, in the regions where he was working. So there was a different, we can, on the basis of Paul's letter, distinguish between levels of authority that different apostles had, authority or leadership. But it is hard to see why Mu also names Paul as having an authority 
authoritative position of leadership, like that of the Twelve, which Junia can't match. Paul's letter suggests the opposite. Paul had the reputation of being an inferior apostle, or not an apostle at all, especially in Corinth and Galatia. Uh, I've already read the verse in Galatians 1.1 where Paul insists that he's an apostle not sent from human beings, but through Jesus Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 9.1, he says, asking them rhetorically, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you. So Paul even admits his own apostolic inferiority in terms of the prevailing criteria for an apostle of Christ. And this comes across most clearly in 1 Corinthians 15, 8 and 9. Here Paul says, Last of all, as to an ektroma, the Greek word means either miscarriage or abortion. Last of all, as to an ectroma, miscarriage or abortion, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, who am not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. So Paul was the last to see the Lord, in contrast to Cephas. Paul was a former persecutor of the church, in contrast to the twelve, who were Jesus' followers. Paul was not fit to be called as an apostle. He was a miscarriage of an apostle, deficient, abnormal. Or he was an abortion of an apostle, monstrous, uh, re re worthy of rejection. Paul says it does not matter to him who they were, referring to Peter, James, and John, because God knows, God shows no partiality. So, in Paul's opinion, God does not favoritize Jesus' closest associates. He also calls them merely flesh and blood. They're, they're just human beings. Yet, on the ground, in the mission field, in the practice of his apostolic ministry, there was a difference. Paul was not the equal of Peter, and Paul knew it. He says he was an apostle by the grace of God and not by virtue of having been with Jesus from the beginning to the end. By the grace of God, I am what I am, an apostle of Christ. So the apostles, Peter and James and John, had higher positions of authority and influence in the early church than the apostle Paul for those reasons. So there was a difference between levels of authority between, uh, among apostles, and Paul was not on the high end, he was on the bottom rung. What then can we say about Junia and Andronicus, who were prominent among the apostles of Christ? Were they, like Peter, James, and John, recognized as having superior apostolic rep qualifications and reputation and influence? Were they superior not only to Paul, but to, the, uh, to other apostles of Christ, of whom there were apparently many? There are several reasons, I think, to say yes, they were. They did have that superior reputation as apostles. First, Paul describes Junia and Andronicus as those who were in Christ before me. And this puts them among, as I said before, the earliest Palestinian Christians probably the Hellenists in Jerusalem. It was the Hellenists who took the gospel outside Jerusalem into the regions of uh, Judea and Samaria, as Acts 8 says. And these apostles ha and, and missionaries had a much greater impact on the expansion of Christianity than the 12, according to um, many scholars. Only Peter among the 12 seems to have been associated with founding churches outside of Jerusalem. We don't have evidence for that uh, from the other, uh, others of the Twelve. So when Paul refers to Junia and Andronicus as those who were before me in Christ, he may have in mind their roles in the expansion of uh, Christianity along with other first-generation Jewish Christ followers. Second, 
the adjective which Paul uses to describe Junia and Andronicus, prominent, can also be translated outstanding, in Greek, episemos. This adjective is found in several Hellenistic Greek sources to describe individuals who have important civic, political, military, and religious roles, or who are wealthy, which was associated with civic and social power influence. Two Greek inscriptions from Asia Minor describe as prominent, episemoi, the founder of a nation, or the chief of a native of native towns, and the general and admirable admiral of a nation, or the ally of Rome, or the secretary of the nation, people with power. Josephus, the Jewish historian, describes particular ambassadors, Saul, Antipas, and Costabaras, who were sent to Florus and Agrippa as prominent in comparison to other ambassadors. Ambassadors had political significance. Lucian describes particular individuals in a large party as prominent, and these include a rich townsman named Ismenodorus, a ruler of Medea named Arsaces, and an Armenian named Oretes. And 3rd Maccabees 6 1 refers to the priest, Eleazar, as prominent among the priests of the country. And finally, Josephus also refers to a woman, Mary of Bethesaba, uh, as prominent by reason of family and fortune. So, as these examples show, the, express, the expression prominent among a group of people. Um, although it's an honorific expression, it implies actual influence and power. It can imply actual influence and power. So Junia and Andronicus, based on the description that Paul gives of them here, we can infer were prominent, leading, authoritative apostles in comparison to other early Christian apostles commissioned by Christ. And it makes sense if Junia and Andronicus were prominent among the apostles in the sense of having superior authority and leadership for Paul to send them greetings in Romans, as he does. For he is planning to come to Rome to get the help of the Roman church for his mission to Spain. He wants to be sent by them to Spain with their help. Now, Paul had an inferior apostolic reputation. He needed backup. He would have benefited from an alliance with these superior, authoritative apostles in Rome, Junia and Andronicus. If my analysis is correct, it is striking that Paul in Romans is forming an alliance with the apostles Junia and Andronicus, his apostolic superiors. For this means that he would have acknowledged the higher position and authority of this female apostle and her male associate, precisely so as to increase his own effectiveness in ministry in view of his inferior apostolic reputation and influence. So I conclude against Mu that Junia did have an authoritative leadership position, such as that held by the Twelve, and also a position superior to that held by Paul. Conversely, I would also venture to say that Paul had his reasons to avoid being subject to the superior apostles in Jerusalem, Peter, James, and John, as implied by Galatians 2, 1 to 10. So Paul doesn't want to be under their leadership. So in short, Romans 16, 7 tells a different story about who held the reins in the early church than that which is usually told on the basis of other New Testament texts. The role of prominent or leading apostle of Christ was open to women, 
on the basis of the resurrected Jesus' appearing to them and commissioning them, and their own continual uninterrupted discipleship to the Lord Jesus. All of these would have, would, could make for an extraordinary apostolic reputation and influence. And this is the kind of apostolic reputation and influence which Junia enjoyed. We can only wonder if more women than Junia filled this position in early Christianity that was open to them. That's the end of my more uh, formal uh, comments. And at this point, I'd like to broaden the discussion and ask how Junia, as I have sketched her here as an apostle, how we fit Junia within the rest of uh, the New Testament uh, texts and teachings on gender, particularly in Paul. And to do that, um, I will expand into a little bit of a more lighthearted mode. And uh, I've written a fictional dialogue between the apostles, Junia, and Andronicus. And I need an associate for this to complete this <laughs> part of my presentation. Who would like to be an apostolic associate? <laughs> All right. All right, so you are Andy, <laughs> okay. and I'm Junia. <laughs> nice to meet you, Junia. <laughs> All right, so you're going to read Andy's part, yeah. and I will read Junia's part. Perfect. Okay. Junia, are you coming? <laughs> Just a minute, Andy. I'm finishing a letter. Well, hurry up then. We'll be late. Okay, here I am. Do you want to hear what I wrote? Not right. Junia, apostle of Jesus Christ, and Andronicus, apostle of Jesus Christ. I hope you don't mind if I put you in there as co-author. To the church in Pompeii, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. That's inspired. I know. <laughs> Remember when you got all embarrassed when you tried to express yourself in front of a group of people? Well, that was because all the men stared at me when I gave my interpretation of the scripture reading after synagogue service. Like, what are you doing? You were definitely breaking the rule of no woman speaking in public. Unless, of course, it's a prof... It's a prophet... Prophetess? Prophetess. Uh, it's a prophetess. Prophetess. Prophetess, sorry. <laughs> then it's okay, because she's speaking God's thoughts, not a woman's thoughts. No wonder the two Marys and Salome just ran off when they saw the empty tomb with the guy in a white robe, and they didn't tell anybody. Who would have believed them? Guess what we saw? The tomb is empty. Jesus is gone, but there was a guy dressed in a white robe, and he told us Jesus is going to Galilee and wants to meet you there. Yeah, right. Well... If I know you, you would not have been able to keep your mouth shut. That's true. But now, I can't keep my mouth shut because he revealed himself to me and sent me to proclaim his message. So I have to speak. That gives me confidence. The same goes for me. Like the Apostle Paul said, Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. Before Christ made me his apostle, I just wanted to find a good wife who would hear me who would bear me ten sons, and to study Torah in my spare time and live to a ripe old age. After I died, I would have lived on through my sons. They would carry on my name and reputation. They would inherit my earthly goods. And I wanted ten sons too, so there would be plenty of people to take care of me when my old man kicked the bucket. After all, you are ten years older than I am. <laughs> you, mean, you mean ten years wiser? Well, children are the Lord's greatest blessing. As the good book says, God blessed Adam and Eve and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. But that was then. God has, had just created the world, and it needed a lot of help to keep it in shape. So he made us human beings in his image and blessed us with fertility. But this world is now passing away. 
It's corruptible. God has begun to make a new world that started when God raised Jesus from the dead. And it's continuing. In Christ, there is a new creation. So what you're saying is that now we look to Jesus as the source of even better blessings in a new creation. Exactly. Now we bear fruit to God as Christ's apostles, rather than as mothers and fathers. That's why there's no command to procreate for those in the new creation. But there is a command to sow to the Spirit. You mean making churches is like making babies? I never thought of it that way, but I guess that's why Paul said he was giving birth to the Galatians over and over until Christ is formed in them. Now there's a man who can identify with a woman suffering. <laughs> Hold on, I've done my share of that too. Remember how the new believers in Pompeii were so immature? They couldn't get along with each other, so I had to keep breastfeeding them with the milk of the simple gospel. That was painful. <laughs> okay, I get it. You feel our pain too. Thank you. My point is that having a lot of quote unquote kids like we do is hard work. That's exactly why Paul and Barnabas didn't marry and have kids, so that they could be completely sold out for the Lord, dedicated to his work in body and in spirit. And by the way, Paul wished that the Corinthian believers would do that too. Does that mean you wish we hadn't gotten married? Oh no, honey. It would take a miracle for me to be able to live without you. Well, thank God that that miracle didn't happen. Here, sign the letter and let's go. I can already hear the crowds down at the Colosseum. There's a spectacle today. There's going to be a crucifixion along with the gladiatorial show. The authorities want to teach the crowds a lesson on why not to break the law. So we'll have a chance to talk about Jesus and how he was crucified too, but not for his own transgressions, for ours. And who's going to be the preacher, you or I? It's my turn to be the main speaker. You second my message, okay? Yes, Madam Apostle, you got it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> bearing with me in a little hilarity. <laughs> All right, so floor is 